Praise be Jesus Christ, and thank you for joining me for Lexio on the Go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our scripture readings are taken from Isaiah 62, 11, and 63, verses 1 through 7. Also from Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 12. And the Gospel, which is going to be the Passion according to St. Luke, chapter 22, verses 39 through 71. And chapter 23, verses 1 through 53. Um, I do encourage you to pause the video at this point and read all, look at the notes and read all of Luke's gospel in its entirety and then come back. These are the readings for Wednesday in Holy Week. Um, for episodes, uh, Lexi on the Go, episodes 234 through 237, we will be focusing on the Passion accounts according to the four gospel writers. Um, I do want to stress that uh, the church fathers did talk about Isaiah being like the fifth evangelist. The evangelists are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, they tell us specifically about um, Jesus. But because Isaiah is so, I guess, almost perfectly portraying Jesus or talking about Jesus, almost word for word, uh, we see the connection. Um, he has been nicknamed the fifth evangelist. So I do want to share some of the readings from Isaiah that are, that are said, uh, this is Wednesday in Holy Week, that these are read. Um, he was wounded for our iniquities. He was bruised for our sins. He bore the sins of many and hath prayed for the transgressors. And if you read these uh, scripture readings from Isaiah, the prophecies of Isaiah, it's just amazing how, uh, you know, he was bruised for our sins and, and just how he takes on the sins of the world. This is his crucifixion. And this is why we read Isaiah during this time. Um, when going into Luke's gospel, there's so many great things, but I want to point out um, some just contrast here. First, the difference between the Word of man versus the Word of God. Now, we know that Jesus Christ is the Word made flesh, and so he is God's holy Word in person. And we see, how does he go to the cross? He goes silently. Um, he is the man of sorrows. He is like a sheep going to the slaughter, and he remains silent. Even when he's questioned in front of the Sanhedrin, even when he is questioned in front of Pilate, he remains very silent. Um, he does answer, but, but very short answers. When he's on the cross, his words are, are very few, but so meaningful. The seven last words is what we call them. Um, so we see that the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ, true God and true man, during his whole passion, his trials, and his crucifixion itself, the way of the cross and the crucifixion, he remains very quiet. The word of God is being silenced. Um, he has taught in the temple area. He has taught in Galilee. He has taught for three years. People have heard him. Um, but now at the end, he chooses to remain silent. Um, and his actions will speak for themselves. His love, his charity will speak for itself. Um, and so while the Word of God is being silenced during the passion and death of our Lord, and there are very few words, what do we see? We see the Word of man. We see the Word of the world. And remember, our, our enemies are the devil, the flesh, and the world. And we definitely see the voice of the world, or the Word of man, which is just noise, 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 noise. Mentioned in the, in, from Matthew's Gospel in, in episode 234, about how the people were, were um, you know, yelling out, the chief priests were yelling out, and the voices were so loud, crucify him, crucify him. And so, and here it says, in, in, in Luke's gospel, it says, and their voices prevailed. Or whose voice is it that's prevailing here? It's the voice of man. And, and what is represented there? Well, we talked earlier about how the chief priests, their voices are prevailing, and they are uh, the, the enemies of Jesus Christ. Uh, they um, refuse to yield to Jesus Christ. Even though at this point, every, all the evidence says that he truly is the Messiah, they are persistent in their disbelief. Uh, they will not believe. They will not yield. Um, it, 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 they think it'll cost them too much. It'll cost them their laws. It'll cost them their temple. It'll cost them their very life. And, and truly it does. To believe in Jesus Christ means to take on a new life. You are a new man in Jesus Christ, right? They don't want to become a new man. They don't want to become a new city. They don't want to. Um, they don't want their laws to be perfected through Jesus Christ, who is the lawgiver itself himself. So, the chief priests' voices prevail. They move the people, and then the people's voices prevail. Um, 
and their voices prevail. So all these voices of the world end up prevailing and loud, 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 while the word of God remains meek and silent. Um, so I, we, we need to think about that in our own life. Um, Jesus remained silent at that point so that his voice can be very vocal now. And so we need, uh, as a member of Christ and his church, we need to make sure that the voice of truth um, the voice of Jesus Christ is heard in our life and in our family and in our friends and in our work. Uh, we need to bring the voice of Christ, which is truth itself, into the world. Um, the word of man still is loud. Uh, the voices still prevail today from the devil, the flesh, and the world, the enemy. But we must now speak the word of truth. We must allow the word of God to be spoken in our society. We cannot be silenced, we cannot be canceled, we cannot be muted, we cannot be forced away or turned down. We must speak the truth and the voice of Christ must prevail. We also see that part of that lie in the voices are, we have found this man perverting our nation. This is what the chief priests say. We have found this man, Jesus, perverting our nation. They think what Jesus is doing is a perversion they, they think he is perverting the nation. There is no perversion in Jesus Christ. He is purity itself. Jesus Christ is purity itself, but yet they will say that the pure Jesus Christ is perverting the nation. Um, and so this is just flat out a lie um, and, and it's ignorance as well. And so here we see a difference between the kingdom of man, a nation in which they think Jesus is perverting, and the kingdom of God. And so if we are holding to this world, we will think Jesus is a perversion. We will think Jesus is intruding on our way of life, our way of thinking. We will think that Jesus is the enemy to our ways and that what we have is good and that Jesus is perverting that good if we hold to the kingdom of man. If we hold to the kingdom of God in its purity, we will see that the sins of this world and the voices that prevail in this world are a perversion to Jesus Christ. So it really depends on what camp you are in. Uh, remember, all the way back in Genesis, uh, God says to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman. The woman is Mary. The offspring of Mary is Jesus. There are two camps. That's what enmity means, two camps, no relation. And so the fact is there are two camps. There is the kingdom of God and there is the kingdom of man. If we are in the kingdom of man, we will think Jesus and his church is a perversion to us. And we will not want anything to do with him. We will want nothing to do with him and his truth and his church now or for all eternity. So we will choose hell. We will choose to be separated from him now and for all eternity. If, however, we unite ourselves to him, we take him on and we live for Jesus Christ, then we will enter in, through baptism, the kingdom of God. And when we are in the kingdom of God, we will see the evils of this world, the devil, the flesh, and the world, as a perversion to that kingdom, and we will want nothing to do with it. So, be not mistaken, there are two camps. There will always be two camps. Um, there will always be two sides. All the way from Genesis to God, the gospel, Jesus says several times, the weeds and the wheat, um, so many examples of this. So which side will we be on? Let us be in the kingdom of God and let us listen to the truth of God, the voice of God, not the voice of the world, and let us not be in the kingdom of the world. Um, remember the statement that Pilate made um, is also, I want to stress this because this is in the gospel, in the passions as well, um, the message in both Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is Jesus of Nazareth, I-N-R-I. -I, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. So, it is Pilate's writing that is the last thing that we remember. Kind of the final say or the final voice. And even though it's meant to be a mockery, Pilate is the legitimate authority in that area representing the empire. And he has his voice through writing as the final statement that this Jesus is the King of the Jews. He will sit on the throne of David forever right? He will establish a kingdom. So the voice of Pilate, ironically, is kind of the last say in writing, so to speak, in stone, there mounted on the cross, that this is the king of the Jews. That voice was, 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 was written down there as a statement. And then this king of the Jews is here to establish a kingdom. 
And the establishment of this kingdom is unlike the kingdoms of this world. The establishment of this kingdom, the kingdom of God, is an eternal kingdom which will last forever. And Jesus Christ is the king of that kingdom. And all are welcomed in that kingdom. The Gentile, the Jew, everyone is welcomed. Um, however, we must leave behind the kingdom um, that we are from. The kingdom of sin, the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of man. Um, and enter into the kingdom of God. Thank you for joining me for this Lexio on the Go. Please take the time to visit linktoliturgy.com where you'll find fast, free, and faithful resources on the gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.